Howard Onstoff from Bernie, Texas. Hey, Howard. How are you, Lou? Good to see you. Good, good. Lou, you did not mention or have not mentioned the neocons in all of this. Uh, I'm afraid that, that the conservatives are being blanketed, uh, or I should say the Republican Party is being blanketed uh, as uh, uh, what Bush represents in it today. Wouldn't we do well both as libertarians and as Republicans, or libertarian Republicans, if you will, to distinguish between these Trotskyites, former Trotskyites, uh, who are, call themselves neocons now, I'm testing on you, <laughs> and the, uh, some of the rest of us? Well, I think, you know, the neoconservatives are an extremely important group of intellectuals who have had a vast influence towards, uh, these are people who, as you mentioned, came out of uh, Trotskyism, Irving Kristol, Norman Podoritz being two of the most famous, and, and many, many others. Uh, young, I mean, Bill, not young, Bill Kristol and uh, John Podoritz, their sons, and of course there are a million people in the Bush administration, columnists, and um, uh, they're very influential, and, and, and they've had a bad effect. Whether they actually corrupted the uh, good-hearted conservatives, I think is another question. I think there was something rotten at the heart of conservatism at the very beginning. Um, the neoconservatives are smarter than the typical conservative, and so they've helped help lead them, and they, these are people who um, uh, are dedicated to war, and they want a, a perpetual, in the old phrase, perpetual war, although for perpetual war for perpetual war, they don't even claim for perpetual peace. Um, and they believe in you know, what they call national greatness, they believe in uh, uh, a huge government. Um, George Bush is, is uh, certainly uh, their kind of guy. Um, they want to, uh, reconstruct the Middle East and the whole world through U.S. power. And they have an unlimited faith in the power of the gun, uh, which is why I think they actually thought that U.S. troops are going to be welcomed with flowers in Baghdad and that everything would go well once you dropped the bombs. And they have a hard time uh, understanding that, that uh, government power can't actually do everything. In fact, it can't do much of all except, except of course, evil. Um, so they've been very influential, but I, I would argue that it goes back to... Uh, the very beginnings of conservatism, Bill Buckley and Russell Kirk and all these people who were long before the neoconservatives started com coming into the Republican Party and the conservative movement in the late 1960s and following. Uh, I think, the, I think the, con the conservatism was, was bad from the beginning. Uh, it was wrong from the beginning to reverse Pat Buchanan's book title. Uh, not right from the beginning. And, um, but the neocons are very bad guys and uh, it's good to you know, good, good to identify them and good to finger them. They're, they're an awful bunch. Yeah. So, oh, yes, sir. Uh, Ed Elmer from San Antonio. Uh, it's been argued that the original Articles of Confederation were more friendly to liberty. Uh, why do you think the early Americans uh, replaced them with our current Constitution? Well, there were you know, ideological battles from the very beginning. You had um, uh, People, Alexander Hamilton being the, probably the most important intellectual on the other side, um, who wanted a far bigger government. Uh, they didn't have a problem with big government under the, under the king. They just wanted it run domestically by themselves and not by London. Um, so they set out immediately to, to have a, uh, a big central government. And probably Shays' Rebellion, as I mentioned, was a major ideological factor in scaring scaring people, they almost did not get the Constitution through, and the Constitution was a step up in centralization and government power from, from, the, from the Articles. They almost didn't get it through. They could only, uh, uh, what they wanted was the Constitution without a Bill of Rights. Um, thank goodness that the, the uh, anti so-called anti-federalists um, were able to get the Bill of Rights affixed to the Constitution. That was the only way they could get it passed. Um, so yeah, I think, I think the Constitution, unfortunately, was a step down. Of course, by our current standards, the Constitution looks like the, the uh, great upland of liberty to us, right? I mean, it would be a huge improvement over what, what there is now. But yeah, I think, I mean, I'm one of, I, I stand with the Anti-Federalists and with uh, Patrick Henry and, and others who thought that the Constitution, by establishing a presidency and a Supreme Court, uh, was going to uh, lead to trouble. And if you read the Anti-Federalists, and there's a, there's a, a one book called the Anti-Federalist Papers, but there are other, other collections and many other articles on. These guys were very prescient. I mean, everything they predicted has all come true, um, which not to say that bad things wouldn't have happened under the articles, because government always wants more. Um, they're constantly in a battle with society to seize more property and more power. Uh, so it's very, very difficult. 
to, uh, uh, to oppose them. And of course, the, the key thing that uh, people like Jefferson thought that, the, that at least it continued under the Constitution was uh, what Jefferson called states' rights, as Ralph Rako mentioned. Uh, that it uh, divided sovereignty, not so much the division of, of uh, powers within the federal government. The key was uh, the power that the states had uh, versus the federal government. This, of course, was abolished by Abraham Lincoln, who uh, the evil guy that uh, Tom DiLorenzo will be talking about later in this conference, and whose uh, Roman temple is in Washington, if you haven't visited it, where he sits in a vast throne of the Jupiter best and greatest with fasces on the, uh, the side of his throne, very appropriately. And uh, so there's the guy who destroyed, what, I think, whatever I hope the original Constitution had in, in uh, um, holding down the power of government. And uh, so it's been off to the races ever since Abe. Yes, sir. Given the comments uh, earlier today and from yourself, um, and given the fact that um, we had a Constitution which created, I think, conditions that were most um, auspicious for the pre preservation of liberty, and that it did fail, uh, was ground under by, Le by Lincoln. Um, what do you make of Ron Paul's candidacy? Let's say if the uh, stars line up, uh, and he is, he is, he somehow wins the nomination and is elected president, and he's up there January 20th, 2009, taking the oath of office. How effective do you think a Ron Paul presidency would be given the political realities we face in America today, the size of government and what, it, what people... Like the old joke, I guess you'd have to start off by saying you're all under arrest. Right? <laughs> for, um, I, you know, I had the great uh, pleasure of working for Ron Paul as his chief of staff a number of years ago in, in Congress, and he definitely is the real article. I mean, he's, he's uh, uh, a man of integrity and uh, deep conviction, uh, a man who never compromised, a man who's held to his, his principles all these years under vast pressure. I'll never forget, for example, the only time that, the, that uh, Ronald Reagan ever personally uh, lobbied him and lobbied him extremely hard, put huge pressure on him, uh, not you'll be shocked to learn to cut the government, but to spend vast uh, billions on the, the, the B-1 bomber, but Reagan was, uh, was putting pressure on Dr. Paul, and of course he wouldn't, he wouldn't give in, he wouldn't give in to any of these guys. Uh, uh, when I saw him uh, at that South Carolina debate, uh, when he answered that question, I thought this is the greatest moment in modern American political history. Uh, it reminds you of why. <laughs> reminds you of why the state puts such vast uh, resources uh, into um, trying to keep inconvenient ideas out of the public discourse. Because, of course, the entire apparatus, the whole regime is based on lies. And uh, if the right person is saying the emperor is naked, uh, they're in trouble. So uh, I've seen, as I'm sure you have all seen, uh, the vast outpouring of support for Ron Paul like nothing I've, I mean, I haven't seen anything like this since, say, the Goldwater campaign, and that was nothing like Ron Paul. And, of course, the Goldwater campaign was only among a, among a minority, and Barry um, was no Ron Paul, um, although, a lot of us liked him at the time. Uh, so this is happening not from the Ron Paul campaign, which is uh, not too far from here in Falls Church. It's entirely decentralized. It's involving tens of thousands of people all across the country, groups. I had one lady who uh, ran Pat Buchanan's, Linda Muller, who ran Pat Buchanan's uh, internet efforts when he was running, and now she's working for Ron. She said, I've never seen anything like it. People in my own neighborhood printing up their own yard signs and groups organizing and people printing bumper stickers and she said just, it's entirely decentralized, unconnected to the official campaign. And this is true all over the country. You've heard about what's happening on the internet. There's never been anything like this politically on the internet. They mentioned Howard Dean. This is a far bigger phenomenon than Howard Dean. Uh, 